and I can hear that some folks are still coming in. As we're talking tonight, when I am sharing the screen in this Zoom format, I cannot see the chat and I really can't even tell necessarily who's speaking. So, um, but you are welcome to interrupt me if you need to, to have clarification on something. Um, if you want to put it in the chat, I'll try to take a break at points and go out and look at the chat to see if I need to answer anything. But I do want to start with just some basic information about the course um, and how you're going to get a grade. This is the first time that this course is being offered in this format. Um, originally, the very first time it was ever taught, it was taught during a May semester in 14 days in a face to face setting. After that, it has been taught only and solely online. So we're trying this approach with the e-classroom to see if that is better for the students. It also, with the capture, with the recording, we'll be able to use that in subsequent semesters um, to help with student understanding as well. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I'm going to go out to the introduction PowerPoint. This one is not in D2L, but it's just a broad overview of the course and the information on the syllabus. So it'll be part of the recording. So this is Business 3000. It's entitled Statistical Analysis for Business. And let me move this out of the way. It is fall semester 2022. It is in this e-classroom format and we will be meeting on Tuesdays from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. I am Laura Ralston. I'll, I'm a professor of mathematics at the institution. I'm actually beginning my 24th year here at Georgia Highlands. Um, I taught middle school and high school mathematics for six years, so I'm actually beginning my 30th year in academia. Um, I do thoroughly enjoy what I do. That usually comes across um, very quickly to students. I can get excited and talk fast, so if I get to talking too fast, you guys can um, unmute and let me know and I'll slow down. I don't think in this format that you'll have a difficulty hearing me, but should you, if you'll let me know, I'll try to adjust my microphone there as well. I'm going to give you my contact information. There is my direct email through um, Georgia Highlands. My office is on the Cartersville campus in the STEAM building. It is building C and I'm in room 107. Should you need and or want to meet face to face, um, that would be the best location to do so. Um, the phone number that's listed there does ring directly into my office. It has voicemail capability. Please make sure you leave me your name and your phone number and I'm happy to return your phone call. Um, you'll notice that I have a variety of office hours in a variety of formats. The two that might be of most interest to you are on Sunday from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. Those are in Zoom so that again we have the benefit of kind of uh, seeing each other. I also have Zoom office hours on Thursday afternoons from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. I'm not opposed to meeting at other times outside the ones listed here um, within reason and with a little bit of notice. I am in the office for face-to-face -face office hours on Mondays and Wednesdays. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I monitor um, email and discussion. So I have virtual office hours on Tuesdays from 9.30 to 10.30, and then again from 1.30 to 3.00. And then on Thursdays from 930, excuse me, to 1030. So hopefully, should you need some help, um, you have um, some time available during those times. Again, if not, um, we can try to coordinate um, a an individual Zoom meeting or even a small group Zoom meeting at different times within reason. 
If you can't tell by my accent, I was born and raised in North West Georgia. I still do actually reside in Calhoun, Georgia, where I grew up with my husband and almost 15 year old daughter. Um, so they're actually here in the house. So you might hear some noise. I don't, I don't know if you do, I apologize for that. They know I'm in class, so maybe they'll be quiet. I attended um, the University of North Georgia in Dahlonega and earned my bachelor's degree in secondary education with an emphasis in mathematics and taught middle school and high school mathematics for three years and then went back to the State University of West Georgia in Carrollton and earned my master's degree in secondary education with an emphasis in mathematics and I went back and taught high school middle school and high school for well actually high school for three more years at Coosa High School in Rome before beginning my career here at Georgia Highlands. I suppose the downside is at this particular point I am the only um, instructor at the institution who has taught business 3000 so um, you're kind of stuck with me. But all of the information, all of the materials that you're going to need to be successful in the course are in D2L with the exception of the statistical software package that we'll be using. So all of the information is in D2L and I will show you in a few minutes how to navigate that material that is inside D2L. Now you can email me inside D2L and I will get the email and respond. I do try to respond to emails and inquiries within 24 hours during the week, Monday through Friday and 48 hours on the weekend. If you do email me, it makes my life a little bit easier um, if you will identify the fact that you're in Business 3000. I actually have six classes this semester, and so it, it's just helpful to know. Um, if you forget to tell me the course, I can, I can look it up. It just takes me longer, which then delays my response to you. So let me pause there for a minute and see if you have any questions before we continue. You may unmute and speak or if you want to type it in the chat, it'll alert me that there's something in the chat. Okay, so Business 3000 is an application-based course in statistics, and it's really specifically statistics um, and applications that can or could be used in business. And they could also be used in a lot of other fields, but this is um, specifically for business. This course does not require a knowledge of calculus. You are required to have taken STAT 1401 elementary statistics. You might have had it as Math 1401 or possibly as Math 2200 the name of the course and the numbering of the course has changed um, in the last few years. So depending on how long ago it was when you took it, um, you may have had one of those other courses. Um, and I have looked and I believe that all of you in the course have had that prerequisite. We will look at a variety of techniques that are used for research in a lot of different fields. But again, we take a look specifically at those that you can use in business and how to apply those to a data set, specifically in logistics and supply chain management and healthcare management, since those are the two bachelor degree programs offered at Georgia Highlands. So some of the topics we talk about are descriptive statistics, probability distributions, hypothesis testing, analysis of variance, chi-square, correlation and regression, and non-parametric test. Um, some of those topics may sound familiar because they are also covered in STAT 1401 or elementary statistics, but we try to dig a little bit deeper in this course and we also look at um, the counterpart to those, which are the non-parametric test. So again, do you have questions before we continue? We are 
are required to connect this course to a textbook and there is not one currently on the market that's free um, that is specific to business. So we have connected this course to a free textbook from openstacks.org entitled Introductory Statistics. It's the same text that's used in STAT 1401 and STAT 2401, but um, we also supplement it with some topics that are not in that text that are um, important or that are focused on in this course. Should you choose to do so, you can access this particular text online for free. You can download a PDF or an HTML, HTML file. However, I would tell you to not bother. I do not refer to the textbook during our discussions. I do not reference the textbook. Um, quite honestly, it is not uh, the best quality. Um, and so my colleague and I have um, wrote, have written, excuse me, correct my English there, written the course in such a way that you can understand it better. It makes more sense, but we are required to link it to a text. So that is the text. Should you choose to look at it, that's fine. Again, I would tell you not to bother. You do need um, a calculator. The calculator that's usually recommended is a TI-83 or 84 plus. However, if you don't have one of those, please do not run out and buy one. You need a basic four function calculator, something that will allow you to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Okay, probably most of you may have one of those laying around the house. Okay, do not rush out and buy a calculator. You can get a Texas Instrument TI-30X as in X-ray, S as in SAM at Walmart or Target or Staples, someplace like that for somewhere between 15 and 20 bucks. But you need one that will do basic mathematical operations, not necessarily the fancy graphing calculator because we are going to be using a statistical software package. Um, the statistical software program that we're going to use in this course is Minitab Online. Now, I realize that a number of you are probably familiar with Microsoft Excel. But guys, Microsoft Excel was never ever intended to be used as a statistical analysis program. It will do it, but it's very clunky and is not user friendly. Minitab, on the other hand, in my opinion, is one of the more user friendly statistical software programs. There are a lot of big name companies that use Minitab. There's um, companies like Coca-Cola, Amazon, Anheuser-Busch, um, even Gerdau that's located in Cartersville um, used to use Minitab. I'm, I'm assuming they still do. Minitab Online, which is the newest version, is um, internet based or cloud based. So it does not matter whether you have a Mac or whether you have a Windows computer. After Wednesday, August the 24th, you'll be able to download mini tab to your personal home computer to use it for free for the semester. Um, you do have to use your Georgia Highlands email address when you create your account that verifies for um, mini tab that you are a student at Georgia Highlands and at the moment Google Chrome is the recommended browser. I'll try to next week um, kind of walk you through those steps, but I have them laid out with screenshots and things already in um, D2L. A lot of students start out thinking that, oh, I've got to learn something else, and they don't really like it. By the end of the semester, they appreciate what Minitab does for you because it's going to perform all of your statistical analyses so that we can focus on what does that information tell us? How is it going to help us?
So here's how you're going to get a grade. Um, one of the things that I'm required to do throughout the semester at two different points in the semester is provide information to um, the administration about your performance in this class. That first report is due next Tuesday, August 23rd, and it is solely based on your attendance. But I cannot base your attendance solely on the fact that you logged in to the Zoom meeting tonight. I'm required to have you do something. So what I have you do is a short, um, it's about eight to 10 syllabus or orientation quiz. We pretty much are gonna cover everything that's on it. There's no math problems um, that on the syllabus quiz to just let me know, hey, yeah, I'm planning on staying and participating in this class. That's worth 10 points. There are homework assignments within D2L, which is the learning management system. There is one for each lesson in the course and there are 12 lessons. So that means there's 12 homework quizzes within D2L. They're worth 10 points each. So you could earn up to 120 points. The midterm exam for the course will be proctored and we use Respondus Lockdown Browser and Monitor for that proctoring. And so to ensure that Respondus Lockdown Browser and Monitor works on your personal computer or the personal device that you plan to take the midterm on, I have you do a practice quiz at the beginning of the term to make sure it works. That's 20 points. The proctored midterm exam will cover the first two modules or first two units of the course and will be worth 150 points. We'll talk more about the details of that midterm exam as we approach that date. The final exam covers the last two modules, module three and module four. It is not proctored, but is also worth 150 points. The other component of the course, the other assessment that we use are mini projects. The mini projects are the application of what we're learning. We're going to talk about it in class. We'll work through some examples together. And then the expectation is, is that you actually perform that particular type of analysis on an assigned data set. I have a data set that I'll show, I'll show it to you in a few minutes. I have one data set specifically for those of you who are in healthcare management, and I have a different data set for those of you who are in logistics and supply chain management. Again, to give you a sense of how this stuff that you're going to be learning can be used in the real world or applied in um, your position in healthcare management or in logistics. So you have the opportunity throughout the semester to earn 800 points total. A couple other things about those grades. One is your homeworks are in D2L. You get three attempts or three tries, you know, sort of like the three strike rule in baseball, but I'm only going to record or write down the highest score that you make. Okay, so, you know, if you take it the first time and you score, say, 50, and you take it the second time and you score 90, and you take it the third time and you score 70, I'm only going to record the 90 in the grade book. I give you those three attempts so that um, you can attempt the homework, and maybe if you do well, that, that indicates that you perhaps understand that content and you can move on. But if you don't score well, then you have the opportunity to go back, review, ask questions, get some help, and then take it a second time or even a third time as needed. I already mentioned that the proctored midterm exam will cover modules one and two. You'll be required to use Respondus Lockdown Browser and Monitor. You'll take that test inside D2L outside of class time. So I usually give you a three to four day window um, to take that proctored midterm exam. The final exam will cover modules three and four. It is not proctored, but it will also be taken in D2L outside of class time. 
And then I mentioned to you about the many projects um, you're going to use to apply concepts and analyses to a specific data set. We'll work on examples in class, but you'll actually do the mini projects outside of class time. Okay, other policies, um, just some college-wide policies that I'm required to make you aware of. Now, again, in this class format, it's a little bit different because the expectation is that you do attend this live Zoom session on Tuesdays from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Again, I understand based on the fact that a lot of you are already employed in your field that you may have work and you might have to work late or have to work period. Um, and so you may not be able to meet the live session. And so we are recording it. It'll be posted by noon on Wednesday so that you can watch it. It is your responsibility to watch it so that you can see or review the content that was covered during that meeting. But should you need to be absent for a lot of meetings consecutively, um, more than five, you know, if you have to have an emergency appendectomy, heaven forbid, um, there is a form we fill out which basically just lets me know that you're going to be absent. It also lets you know that I'm willing to let you do the work um, that you're going to be missing. I've already alluded to the early warning project, which is a project at the institution where we try to help you be successful by letting you know at various points in the term how you're doing. Again, the first one of those is solely based on your attendance and whether you have attended the class. And again, I verify your quote attendance through the syllabus or the orientation quiz. The second report that I make is on Wednesday, September the 28th, and it is related to your course progress. It not only looks at attendance, but we also look at, are you doing the course? You know, are you doing your homework? How are you doing on those homeworks? Are you seeking the help that you need? Are you doing the things um, to be successful in the course? And if you're not, then typically someone from the Student Success Center reaches out to you to try to help you be aware of some of the options that are available um, and talk about other things you can do to help yourself get on track and be successful in the course. If at some point you have the need or feel the need that you need to withdraw from the course, the withdrawal deadline to withdraw without penalty is Monday, October the 17th. Of course, the expectation is, is that you're respectful of the instructor as well as your classmates. In this format, sometimes um, that may be a little bit challenging because people don't want to talk over one another. Um, we'll try to do the best we can. Again, when I'm in this share mode, I can't really see um, the chat. And so you pretty much are gonna have to unmute and speak because I don't have the benefit of seeing um, the confused looks on your face. Okay, so we'll try to do that as best we can and get through that. Um, cheating or the appearance of cheating is obviously not tolerated. Um, if you are suspected, we have to have a conversation. Um, there's forms to fill out. It can be referred to student life. It does go on your permanent record and can follow you from institution to institution. Quite honestly, I don't anticipate a problem. I've been here, like I say, almost 24 years and I can count on one hand the number of incidences that I've had. Okay, so let me pause for a minute. Any questions? for special accommodations. Um, those accommodations have to come through um, disability support services. Their contact information is there on the screen. So you would need to contact them directly, provide them the appropriate documentation, and then they will notify me about 
what accommodations you may need or what accommodations you are permitted to have. I'm happy to make those accommodations. I just need to be aware of them. Um, we're not really going to be on campus, so I don't think we have to talk about children on campus. Georgia Highlands College is a weapon free zone under House Bill 280. Um, again, we're not on campus, so hopefully that will not be an issue. Again, on campus, we are tobacco free, no cigarettes, e-cigarettes, snuff, smokeless or chewing tobacco. Um, again, we're not on campus, so that shouldn't be an issue. Some students sometimes are applying to a special program or for whatever reason need their grades prior to the end of the term. And so there is a form you can use to request that. Again, I'm happy to provide that information. I just have to be aware of it. And this is the format that is used for that. Also, don't forget about the resources that are available to you. Obviously, as your instructor, I am considered the subject matter expert and really should be your first call or your lifeline should you struggle with the course content. And hopefully you can, we can meet sometime during my office hours. Again, I'm not opposed to meeting outside those within reason. Um, and with a little bit of notice and planning. So when you begin to struggle when the front from the first time or first point that you start to struggle, you need to reach out again, even in this e classroom format, I don't have the benefit of seeing your confused look on your face or kind of see you tense up because you really are not understanding what we're talking about. So you have to speak up and advocate for yourself. Sometimes students like to form study groups that may or may not work within um, this e-classroom format or semi-online format. But if you choose to do that, that's perfectly fine. Just be careful that you are actually participating and contributing to the study group and you're not relying on someone else or the others to do the work for you. Georgia Highlands does offer free tutoring. Um, they offer it virtually and in person and have a daily drop in and um, they do those at some different kind of hours. So if you need them in the evening, um, there probably are some virtual office out virtual tutoring hours available. I have had this tutor um, actually take this course or at least be in the course during the semester so she's aware or they're aware of the content and are familiar with the expectations of the course. We also have STEM 411 which truly is a 24-7 tutoring system. It's monitored by um, the faculty in the STEM school or instructors like me and if we're on there live, we can chat with you if you come into STEM 411 or you can leave a question and someone will pick it up and provide you with an answer. I believe typically within 24 hours, Monday through Friday and 48 hours on the weekend. So there are some resources out there. Again, your first resource should be me. Okay, I've hit the high points of the course syllabus. You may want to look over it in its entirety and I'll show you how to access that in D2L in just a minute. And after you do that, you need to complete um, the orientation quiz by Sunday, August 21st at 1130 p.m. Again, that is how I am able to determine your quote attendance in the course and report it to the administration. I anticipate that most of you have been at Georgia Highlands for a while and are probably familiar with um, D2L, but I want to be sure that you understand how to navigate Business 3000 specifically. So I'm going to toggle over to um, the course in D2L. And let me stop sharing for a minute and see if any of you have questions before we move on and I'm going to kind of take attendance based on who's logged in. So give me just a minute. Okay. 
Any questions so far? Okay, then let's go out to, I'm gonna share my screen again. And I'm gonna go out to the course. Okay, I, I'm assuming that most of you know how to log into D2L. Once you get logged in, you would have, you know, all of your courses are listed. This is statistical analysis for business. And so we select that course which takes you to the home page for the course. Um, so you're familiar with the layout. On the left-hand side are the announcements. Um, right now, it does have the welcome announcements. I try to post announcements weekly to kind of help you keep on pace and know what's due you when. Um, one of the things that I try to do in those announcements is provide the links to the activities or things that you need to complete. So for example, if you scroll about halfway down the welcome announcement, you'll see the second step, you know, to do start here is the orientation. It says for it should say to. I'm sorry, I got a typo error there. But I have the link. Now when I click on it, it doesn't look like it will for you. But if I click on it, it will take me directly to that quiz. Now for you guys, it's going to look more like this. Okay, and you can start the quiz and answer the questions. Okay, so you can use those links and it'll take you directly to the assignment. And I do try to do that to make it a little bit easier for you so that you can navigate directly to that particular item without a whole lot of difficulty. The Zoom link that we will use each week is really the first announcement that I had posted. I haven't figured out how to pin it at the top of the screen, so it'll be at the bottom of the list each week, or you, perhaps you can bookmark it so that you have easy access. It does not require you to have um, a passcode. Okay, and so you want to check in and look at those announcements maybe um, each week so that you kind of keep up with what's going on. Now, there are two ways to navigate the course. One is through the content browser, which you see on the right hand side, or you can also use the navigation widgets that are at the top of the screen. I want to talk about the content browser first and then we'll talk about the other one. So the first folder says start here. So obviously that's where we need to start. You have a welcome to business 3000 and it has kind of a welcoming statement. All of my contact information, my office, my email, my phone number, it provides you with the link to the course syllabus and a link to the course outline. And I want to click on the course outline and open it up because I want to show you how it's laid out and what information it provides. So again, this is a new format. So I do reserve the right to make changes to the due date. It would be to your betterment, not to penalize you in any way because I've never taught it this way. So we'll just have to kind of play it by ear. So it indicates that the orientation stuff must be completed by Sunday, August 21st. And then like for today, it is Tuesday, August 16th. That's our live Zoom session. And we're gonna talk about data and visualization in D2L. And then you'll have the quiz to complete will be due by Sunday, August 21st. And you'll see pretty much that that's the, con the consistency. What our live Zoom session will be on Tuesday and the homework quiz will, will be due the following Sunday. And if there is a project due, it's due on Monday. And I tried to be consistent with that um, throughout the term. You can see if you want to go ahead and bookmark it somewhere on your calendar, the dates for the midterm are Monday, October 3rd through Saturday, October the 8th. That gives you about a six day window to take it. The one thing I will tell you is you have to take it in one sitting. You cannot start, stop, start, stop. Um, and I believe 
I have to double check for you. It's either a two hour or two and a half hour time limit. I'll have to check because I don't remember off the top of my head. Okay, so that's kind of what your, that, that's a good document to print and keep handy. That'll let you know what we're covering um, at a particular session. I do have links to the textbook. Again, we have to link it to a textbook. They're there, use them, don't use them. And then at the bottom of the landing page, you have again, the same links that were in the announcement. You have the link to the orientation quiz and the link to the Respondus Lockdown Browser Quiz. So again, I try to make it easy to navigate. Okay, so that gets you, this is under the Start Here folder. You'll also find under the Start Here folder, the instructions on how to download Minitab, you have my biography and a document that shows my office hours. On this document, I'll open it up. You'll see um, again when I have classes, when I don't have classes, whoop. And it will also give you the links for the Zoom office hours on Thursday and on Sunday. Okay, so let's go back to the content browser. Academic Excellent Resources, that just lets you know about some of the resources available at Georgia Highlands, the tutoring center, the writing center, that sort of thing. Student resources are more for your mental and physical wellness. So there are some, um, inf there's some information resources there. Exam testing gives you the detailed information about Respondus Lockdown Browser. This is the folder that I mentioned earlier called Zoom Recordings. If we try to go into this folder, I'll have it sorted by units or modules. Right now, there's no content because this is where I'm going to post the links or the videos from the class. So tomorrow, tomorrow by noon, there'll be a video of tonight's session in this folder. So should you miss class or unable to attend, that's where you're going to find the recordings. I also have created step-by-step um, -step instructions for Minitab and I have those already available in the course. We'll walk through them together in class so hopefully you won't need them but if you want them for referral they're there. Then we have our four units of content. And I'm going to click on this and kind of show you the layout of each module. So each one has an introduction. So it kind of like be the chapter opener if you want to think about it like chapters, it kind of gives you a broad overview of what is going to be talked about in that particular module. It gives you the course and the module objectives, the things that you should be able to do um, at the end of that module or end of that unit. I can also navigate with these right and left arrow buttons. If I click on the next one, it just takes me to the next topic. So the first topic in module one is called data and visualization. This is the landing page for that lesson. It gives you a short, brief description of what we're going to be talking about, kind of a checklist of what you need to do. And then you're going to have PowerPoints or extra notes and resources. Again, this course has been taught um, for the last two, two and a half years solely as an online class. So as I discovered um, students were struggling with a particular topic, I tried to create additional resources. And so you may find that there are more extra notes and resources in certain lessons than there are others. But it gives you the PowerPoints um, that you can view, you can print them out like your notes and make notes as we go through our discussions. Um, there are flow charts that kind of help you out um, with making a decision about certain things, kind of like a logistics model, if you will. Um, there's extra practice for classifying data. 
those PowerPoints have also had voiceover and have been recorded again originally because that was the best option for online. I didn't have a class that I could record, so I just recorded them and then they're posted. Not all of those videos were created by me. Um, I did a few of them in the beginning and then my colleague actually did most of them towards the later parts of the course. So you'll notice a difference in the voice as well. And then at the end of that landing page, at the bottom of the landing page, gives you a link to the quiz so that you can go out and take the quiz for that particular lesson. So all of the lessons are pretty much set up that way throughout modules one through four. And so there is, it's reasonably easy to navigate those. Hopefully you won't have any difficulty. At the end also, let me show you the projects. For example, at the end of module one, you're gonna be doing mini project one and again, it's an application of things that we've already been doing in class. And I, if you're doing logistics and supply chain management, I have assigned a specific data set and given you some information and helpful hints that you may need throughout the semester as you work on those projects. Again, same thing for um, healthcare management, you have a specific data set. And guys, these are what we would call big data data sets. These are uh, like 300 to 10,000 pieces of data. Students have always struggled with getting the data uploaded to Minitab. So I have created videos depending upon which format you have. And again, we'll I'll demonstrate that for you during the class period when we get to the point of needing to do so. So try not to leave you hanging and provide you with the information that you need during the class time to help you be successful. Um, I hope to kind of add in some things to help you guys um, work together and interact during the session so that I'm not always going to be the talking head that um, I seemingly am tonight. So you can navigate. One option is to navigate through the announcements. Second option is through the content browser. Third option is through the navigation widgets at the top of the home page. Primarily, you're going to use content items and focus on the content that takes you to the page. And on the left hand side, it has all of the different units or modules that you can use all of the different folders. So content items get you to basically all of the lesson material. If you need to get to the quizzes, those are assessments, or I was calling them evaluations. And you can go to quizzes and quizzes all of the quizzes for the course are listed there. And so you can locate the one, one that you need. If you know, excuse me, that you need quiz two, you can locate quiz two, click on it, and it'll take you to it. I do have, I believe, it's not a requirement, but I do have, I believe, in the discussions area, and maybe I didn't put it in here. I, I was gonna put in, a discussion for you where uh, if you had a question dear outside of class time you could just drop a quick email or a quick post and then I can respond to it um, I forgot to do that so I'll go back and do that so that'll be under discussions once I get there um, to get to email you can go under communication um, and click on email to get grades if you want to look at your grades you can click on the grades and that takes you to the grade book. I get to see everybody's, you would see only yours. And if you wanna go back to the home page, you can always click on home. Again, I anticipate that most of you probably know how to navigate the course, but just in case, um, do you have questions before we continue?
one of the things that I've noticed again over the last few semesters teaching this particular course is that students a lot of students have waited um, a significant amount of time between taking stat 1401 elementary statistics and taking this course and sometimes that is a little bit of a struggle because a lot of the content in the first two modules is stuff that we talked about in elementary statistics. We expand on it, extend it, talk a little bit more about some of other similar topics. Um, but the challenge is if it's been a while, you may have forgotten that. So it's like you're having to relearn it. So I want to do a poll and find out how long it's been since you took STAT 1401. It could have been called Math 1401 or Math 2200. Okay, I think I have everybody because there's 15 of us. Okay, so looks like, um, let me share it with you guys. It looks like that the majority of you, it's been more than a year since you had STAT 1401. So there might be a little bit of a steeper learning curve or steeper remembering curve than some of the others who've had it more recently. So just be aware of that, that again, ideally, and you can you can spread the word to your um, friends in the BBA program. If as, as soon as they take STAT 1401, they need to take Business 3000 the next semester. Okay, and all they have to do to do that is be declared as a BBA degree student. Okay, they don't have to, and, and take stat 1401. So again, I just think it'll make it easier, but we're going to try to get through it together, even those of you who have had uh, it more than a year ago. Okay, questions. All right, again tonight I realize it's more like a talking head, but we've got to kind of get all the introduction out of the way. And I do want to look at the introduction to module one. And I took the information that's in D2L and put it more so in a PowerPoint presentation format and added some information to it. Um, really some information that I present in STAT 1401 to kind of help hopefully jog your memory um, about things you learned in that course. So I do want to go ahead and do the module one introduction unless you guys have questions. Now, I know that you may not be sitting there the full two hours in front of me. Um, you may need to, you know, get up and go to the restroom, get a snack, get a drink of water or whatever. Um, your camera is not on, so it's not likely that I would recognize that again as I'm speaking or going through this discussion if you have questions please unmute and speak or type it in the chat box it will notify me that there's a message in the chat and I'll take a look at it so module one in this course and every now and then I get hung up and looks like it's hung up I have to kind of stop the share and let it do its thing for a minute. It gets crazy and picky sometimes. Okay. Now, let me share again. And start the PowerPoint. Okay. So a lot of students, you know, usually one of the questions you get is, why in the world do I have to take this math class? Well, Maybe not as much, but sometimes we get, why in the world do I have to take statistics? Quite honestly, I think statistics is one of the um, more 
uh, useful mathematics, or some people call it a science, one of the more useful mathematics or useful sciences that you learn. Um, my division chair or my school chair and even the president of the college the other day talked about statistics being sexy. So I don't know. I hadn't quite got to that point yet. But so when and where will I use statistics? Guys, you probably do not get through a day without hearing or seeing at least one statistic. Most people um, get familiar with probability and statistics through various media. But guys, if you listen to the radio, watch television, look at the internet, newspapers, magazines, guys, even social media, you're going to be inundated with statistics. And so I looked up a few. Um, there was an article on 11 Alive News out of Atlanta that stated Atlanta has seen already seen 100 homicides in 2022. Um, CNN had this report that over the last 12 months, grocery prices soared 13.1%, the largest annual increase since the year ending in March 1979, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Education. Um, for the fourth year in a row, Georgia public school students outperformed their counterparts in the nation's public schools on the SAT, recording a mean score of 1,077, excuse me, 39 points higher than the national average for public schools. Politics. The survey of 950 Georgia adults, including 753 registered voters, found Kemp holding a one-point lead over Abrams, 45% to 44%, which is statistically considered a tie. And then real estate, median U.S. home price exceeds 400000 for the first time, according to a report. And that, that was on Fat Fox 5 Atlanta. Guys, they're everywhere. And the challenge becomes you see them, you hear them, but then you have to stop and think, are they giving me the whole picture? What does it mean to be statistically a tie or you know, what is that, you know, what, what is a mean score of 1,077? You have to decide, are they reporting it accurately? Are they using or abusing those numbers in a way that is inappropriate? And again, guys, look at all the fields, um, criminal justice, business, education, political science, again, business, real estate. Statistics is used in almost every field. And again, we just saw that. But guys, even more so on a personal level, you'll see that at some point in your lifetime, you are probably going to be given statistical information. Guys, if you have children and they bring home their reports from the Georgia Milestones, or they bring home their SAT scores, or even if they bring home their report card, you're getting statistical information. And there again, it, it may be you need to know what that means, you know, um, in terms of their scores with respect to their fellow classmates, to all the students in Georgia or all the students across the nation. Um, even things like buying a house, managing a budget, um, are statistically related. My niece recently um, over the weekend bought a new car and she has spent the last um, month or so researching different cars or vehicles that she might be interested in, looking at things like headroom, turn radius, you know, the gas mileage, I mean, you know, and some people do that, some people don't, but that helped her, those statistics, those numbers helped her make a decision about which car she wanted to buy. Um, of course, we have to also go and try, try them out and give them a, a test drive before making that final decision. 
Oh, it's stuck again. Did this to me earlier today, so let me get out of it again. It likes to hang up on me for some reason. I do not know why. Not my thing. Okay, let's try again. So even the fields of, you know, things like economics, business, psychology, for you to earn your degree in those fields, they most of them require at least one course in statistics. Now, all of you've had that first course because you had stats 1401. So again, even that basic knowledge of elementary statistics can be impressive to an employer and or future employer. But ultimately, you as the consumer, as the citizen, as the employee, have to make a decision about the correctness or the accuracy of a statement, claim, or fact. And statistical methods, some of the analyses that we're going to learn, are going to help you make that determination about those claims or facts. So we kind of talked about when and where it's used, so why should we study statistics? One is in a lot of fields, especially in fields like psychology, education, perhaps maybe even in business, I, I'm, I'm not sure, they like people to stay quote current and that means that you kind of keep up with what's going on. You know, what's the new trends in logistics and supply chain? Or what's the new trends in healthcare management? And one of the ways you do that is by reading research that someone else has done. Perhaps you don't have the time or interest to do the research yourself, but you can read the research that other people have done. And having a basic, excuse me, basic simple knowledge of, you know, the vocabulary, symbols, concepts, that kind of thing, you're going to um, be able to read and understand those studies. At some point, you might have to do research in your field. Um, my husband works for Lowe's Regional Distribution Center in Adairsville. And he oftentimes talks about how that they'll come out and do like a time study. They'll actually follow the employee, my husband, around to see how long it takes him to do a particular task. So there, you know, his supervisor or someone's being asked to do research. So they collect, they're having to collect the data, but then they also have to know how to analyze it and interpret or summarize what that data means. And hopefully that they know how to do it correctly. But also, as I pointed out, it also, studying statistics, even just a basic common knowledge, can help you be a better consumer, a better citizen, and really even a better employee. So there are three lessons total in Module 1, and all of them, for the most part, are things that were discussed in STAT 1401 in elementary statistics. Now we discuss them in a lot faster pace because it's hoped that you are already familiar with that information. But we start out talking about data and visualization, then we go to descriptive statistics, and then we go to some probability concepts related to random variables. So those are kind of the three main topics in module one. especially since some of you um, have not had um, STAT 1401 in a while, it might be of benefit if we take a minute and talk about um, some of the basic vocabulary and before we dive into data and its visualization. So, I want to look at just some of the basic vocabulary that you need to be familiar with that hopefully 
um, it'll be a quick review for you, things that you should have already learned so that we can um, jump into data and visualization. So I pulled this information from the lesson in Statistics 1401, but I want to share it with you because again, it's vocabulary and you may have forgotten it because we need to be able to communicate with one another. And I forgot to share my screen. This particular PowerPoint is not in D2L, so you may want to make yourself some notes as you're as we're going and then I'll post the video. I'll try to go a little bit slower. And again, please interrupt should you have questions. So this is again from SAT 1401. We start out talking about a variable. Most research begins with a question. There's something that you want to know about. That something is the variable. It's the characteristic of interest for each person or each thing in the, and I'm gonna make some notes here, in the focus group. Okay, so in layman's terms, and I have it written here, in layman's terms, the variable, I kind of think about the variable is the what. Okay, the variable is what you want to know about. And ideally that variable is random, meaning there's, there's no, its value is determined by chance. There's not really a pattern to what's what. And guys, that can be anything from eye color, height, weight, age, um, the shipment mode. How are they going to ship it? Are they going to ship it, you know, by truck, by boat, by airplane? Um, it might be their blood pressure, preferred soft drink, salary, political affiliation. So the variable is what you want to know about. And usually you can identify the variable because it's basically kind of the question you would ask, you know, like if I wanted to know something, I'd walk up to you and say, well, how old are you? Or what is your eye color? Or how tall are you? So again, that's the what, that's the variable, because it's going to vary from person to person. It's typically, just like it is in algebra, it's typically denoted by the letter X. Data is the responses. So when I walk up to you and I say, well, what color are your eyes or how old are you or whatever, the data is the information that you're giving me. That's the response. Data is kind of the fancy statistical term for information. Okay, so the responses you get when you ask the question become your data. Data is plural, if you don't know. The word datum, D-A-T-U-M, is singular. So, you know, for eye color, you might respond blue, green, hazel, or brown. For political affiliation, it might be Republican, Democrat, Independent. Okay, so the date, the variable is the what, the data is the response to that variable. Typically, when we are doing research, we have kind of two focus groups, if you will. We have the population and we have the sample. The population is really the group, the particular group that I'm really interested in, that I really want to know about. It's what I call the big picture focus. And it involves all the items, all the individuals, all the objects, all the measurements, everything, all. Okay, it's the big picture focus. So some examples might be the governors of the 50 United States. 
all 9,687,653 people living in Georgia. All 5,702 GHC students in spring 2018. But guys, think about this, especially with 9,687,653 people living in Georgia. Think about the difficulty of getting information from every one of those people. And for you to have the population, that's what that means. You would have to get information from every single one of those people. Guys, think about how many boxes or how many shipments Amazon sends out in a day. Do you really think they could keep information on every single, they probably can because it's probably computerized. But getting information from every single person on every single item can be very challenging. It could be expensive and time consuming. So most times when we do research, we use a sample. A sample is a subset of the population. Subset, it's smaller, it's more manageable group that I probably have easy access to, and it only involves some of the individuals or objects. Now, when we're dealing with that sample, we want that sample to be what we call random and representative. Random again means basically that there's no pattern or rhyme or reason to the people that are selected. And in STAT 1401, we discussed some various sampling techniques that kind of ensure that you have a random sample. If you're not careful and if you don't have a random sample, then sometimes that creates a bias and can be problematic when you get to your final conclusion. To be representative means that your sample has the same characteristics as the population. So if I know that my population is, you know, say 60% female and 40% male, I can then choose my sample in such a way that it's also 60-40 to ensure that representativeness. So for example, instead of trying to get information from all 9 million plus Georgians, we could randomly select 500,000 of them. And you think, well, Ms. Ralston, that's not really small. Well, ideally you want to use at least 5% of the population. That's the ideal. Now that's not always possible, but that's the ideal. We might choose only 100 GHC students um, that were enrolled in Math 2200 during spring 2018. Okay, so to show you that in a visual way, the population is the big picture. Let's see if I get my pen to write here. My population is the big picture. So it's the big circle. And from that population, we choose the sample, which is our small group. But notice how this, this sample is completely inside the population. Again, that gives us the idea that it has to be representative, that my sample has the same characteristics as the population associated with each of those um, groups with the population and with the sample, there are numerical measurements, okay? The parameter is the numerical description of a population. Notice that parameter and population both start with the letter P. And sometimes they'll even emphasize it. They'll call it population parameter, P and P. It's the numerical description. So that's even things like finding the average or the median or some, you know, most popular um, 
you could even do least popular. But they're measurements associated with the population. But again, thinking about trying to calculate those things, those parameters is challenging. Again, because did I really get information from all 9 million plus Georgians? So do I really have all of them? Okay, so that makes it kind of impractical, if not impossible to calculate it. It's often, the parameters are often estimated. And it's what we call a fixed number, meaning it's constant. It's gonna, it, you have the population is the population and it's not gonna change. So the value of the parameter is not gonna change. A statistic is the measurement associated with the sample. Okay, notice it is S and S, sample statistic. It is the numerical description for a sample. And these we can calculate. Um, you may have learned in high school how to calculate things like the mean, the median, the mode. I know you would have learned that in STAT 1401. And so those statistics are connected to the sample. Now, what we run into though, is that those numbers will vary from sample to sample because I have different, different items or different people in those samples. And we actually, what we do is we use what we learn about the sample to estimate the population parameters. And we'll learn how to do that um, as we go throughout this course. Again, here's a picture to kind of help you put it together. You have population parameter. Again, notice they both start with P and you have sample statistic, both start with S. I found this table years ago in a textbook and it's a really great comparison of the population to the sample. The population is the whole group whereas the sample is part of the group. The population is the group I really, really want to know about, but the sample is the one that I'm able to really figure out that I can really know about. Population parameters are typically unknown and are fixed, whereas statistics are known or can be calculated, but they change from sample to sample. So that's a great comparison of those two things. And that just gives you um, an overview of the vocabulary that's gonna carry over from SAT 1401. And hopefully that'll benefit some of you that um, haven't had the course in a while. But I wanna try to get you talking for a minute we got about 45 minutes left. And so I want us to look at this example and talk about and think about what our variable, our population, our parameter and so forth would be for this group, for this particular scenario. So take a minute, read the scenario and think about it. Maybe even jot down some notes. Okay. And then we'll talk about it in just a minute. Okay, and I'm literally gonna give you a minute. I'm watching the clock. Okay, by my clock, it's been about a minute. So for this problem in this scenario, what is the variable that you're interested in? Okay, 
Okay, somebody's put an answer in chat. You're welcome to unmute and speak. Okay, um, A. Murray says amount of money spent per student. That's correct. Okay, it is the amount of money first year college students spend on school supplies and you got even put the little caveat not books notice guys when i kind of write that out or describe it notice all the adjectives guys the details are important in statistics it gives the research, it gives the scenario, it gives the problem context. Okay, so it's important to include all of the details. All right, what would be your population? And I will say that sometimes the population is not explicitly stated in the scenario, you may have to read between the lines, but what is your population? You can use the chat or you can unmute and speak. ABC college students. Okay, which ones? Maybe all of them, all first year of college students. Yes. ABC college. Very good, it's gonna be all first year college students at a b c college again notice the details the population is all and we're limiting it to first year college students at this specific college not just any college Okay, what, what is the parameter or the measurement that we would calculate for that population? The average amount of money. Okay, the average amount of money, correct, okay. It even, it does tell us that in the problem, it says average or mean. So we want the average, that's the measurement, amount of money spent on school supplies by or for all first year college students at ABC college. Again, guys, notice how I'm putting in those details. The details are important, okay? The details are important. Again, also, I wanted, I wrote it that way specifically too, because I want you to remember or realize that the parameter is connected to the population, that it's the measurement for all of those first year college students. All right, what's the sample? Is there a sample or did we use them all? Is it the 100 student survey? Yes, very good, Lily. Okay, we surveyed, see we didn't do them all because it says we randomly survey 100 first year students. So my sample is the randomly surveyed or the randomly selected 100 first year students at ABC College. OK, 
Okay, what would be the statistic? What would be the measurement associated with that sample? The average amount of money spent by the 100 randomly surveyed first year college students. Very good, Jada. Okay, so it's the average amount of money. It's the same measurement that we had for the population. It's the average amount of money spent on school supplies, but it's for the randomly selected 100 first year students at ABC College. Again, guys, notice all of the detail. The devil is in the details with statistics and it gives it context. But again, I wrote it out really probably longhand here as well, because again, I want you to realize that the statistic is connected to the sample, to that small group. Okay, questions. All right, moving on then, we're going to take a look at really the first lesson in module one, which is data and its visualization. Now this PowerPoint is available in D2L. There's already a voiced over video there, but this may help you more so than it. Okay, so data and its visualization. And again, this is really information that hopefully you can recall from previous courses, the previous course. Data, as I mentioned, is the actual responses or values you get when asking about a particular variable. Examples, eye color, your data would be blue, green, hazel, brown, height, age, salary, political affiliation, okay? But data is grouped or classified by its characteristics. And it's important to know from the beginning, when you're conducting research, it's important to know from the beginning what type of data you have. Because knowing what type of data you have kind of determines what type of statistical analyses you can and cannot do. So you've got to know how to group or classify the data from the beginning. And data is classified in two different ways. It's classified by type. It's also classified by level of measurement. And so this is a quick overview of how it's broken down. This one refers to the type of data. And there are two categories. You can have qualitative data, okay? Let me see if I can help make some notes here as we go for you. Okay, you have qualitative data, which is here on the right hand side. If you look at that, that is the adjective form of the word quality. Qualitative data is also sometimes called categorical data because it's usually categories which involves words or phrases. Um, example of this would be um, eye color, political affiliation, um, shipment mode, um, gender would work for healthcare management, even eye color maybe. Um, sometimes though, you got to be careful. Sometimes it would, it can be numeric but it's not really a number that we would necessarily use in calculations. So it might be, um, think about like Jersey numbers for basketball players or football players um, or um, your student ID. It's a number, it's a label, it's how we track you in the computer system, but I wouldn't calculate with your student ID numbers. 
So more times than not though, qualitative data is going to be words or phrases. You then have kind of the opposite of that. You have quantitative data, which I have on the left hand side. Quantitative data um, is the adjective form of the word quantity. And so quantitative data involves counts or measurements. And it will always, always, always be numbers that we can calculate with. Um, this one would be things like, you know, age, height, weight. Um, I know at Lowe's they used to talk about how much cube was on the yard. Um, that has to do with how much material is on there. Um, cube can be related to the volume or the size of the box. So that's a quantity. And if it is quantitative, quantitative can be broken down further into two additional categories. You have discrete. Discrete is usually going to be whole numbers and involves counting. You know, you have one box, two box, three boxes. Guys, you can't have half a box. You either got a box or you don't have a box. There's no halfway. Okay, so typically discrete involves counting, no fractions or decimals. And then you have continuous. Continuous is associated with measuring. Okay, and so you could have fractions and decimals. Um, this would be things like maybe like the weight because a box could weigh three and a quarter pounds or, you know, a thousand and um, a thousand point eighty five pounds or something. You can have fractions or decimals. It's on a continuous measurement scale. So hopefully that's familiar. Again, that's something that you would have learned in STAT 1401. So data can be classified by type, and this is by type. And so you have to determine, do you have quantitative discrete, quantitative continuous, or do you have qualitative? And again, knowing from the beginning what type you have determines what kind of analysis you can and cannot do later. The other way to classify data is by using what's called the level of measurement. And there are four levels of measurement. And the higher you go, if you think about it like a staircase, sort of like I have drawn here, the higher you go, okay, if you start, the more you can do with the data, okay? So with nominal data, there's very little that you can do but at the ratio level, there is a lot more you can do. We can consider, if you notice, I've got this big red line in the middle of my staircase. The first two levels are applied to qualitative data only. The last two levels apply to quantitative data only, okay? So real quickly, nominal is the adjective form of the word name. So nominal is like just categories. There's no sense of order and there's no calculations because it's going to be words. So this would be things like gender, um, eye color, that idea of shipment mode. Okay, one's not necessarily better than the other. There's no sense of order. There's just categories. The fact that I have green eyes and my daughter has blue eyes, one's not better than the other. My husband has one brown and one green eye. So, you know, that's kind of weird, I guess. Then you have the second level, you have ordinal. And as you move up, you don't lose the characteristics from the step before. So ordinal is still categories, but now you have a sense of order to them. But that sense of order is subjective. It's open to interpretation by 
the researcher, by the person. Um, this I always think about like some kind of, you know, like a judging contest, like um, a chili contest or a, a bake off or something like that, or even like a race. Now, sometimes a race might be a little bit more so than ordinal if it's timed, but it's like judging. Um, you, you, you know, I could, my brother-in-law does a competition barbecue and one week he may, you know, place first and then the next week he may place last because the judges changed. And so there's different um, interpretations of that data, but there's a sense of order to it. Um, think about movie ranks. You know, we go from G to PG-13 to PG to um, R and so forth. So movie ranks is a good one to think about with ordinal. There's that sense of um, order to it. And again, those two levels only, only, only apply to qualitative data. And again, because those two categories are primarily words, phrases, there's very little that you can do with it. Okay, there's no calculations. You can talk about the one that was most popular, the one that was least popular. You know, you can talk about how many each category had, but you don't really calculate with those. As we move to the third level, we begin to get into the numbers or the numbers game, if you want to think about it that way. But so at the interval level, okay, you have numbers. Um, there is an objective order. I mean, we can, you know, put them in order one, two, three, four, five. Um, you can add and subtract, so you can begin to make some comparisons. You know, I can say that um, Johnny is taller than Susie, or, um, you know, one, uh, some, a, a feather is lighter than a rock. Um, you know, you, I can begin to make those comparisons. The one piece of the interval that really freaks students out is this idea that it does not have a true zero. When we hear the word zero, most times, I would anticipate that you think of none or nothing. But at the interval level, that interpretation, that meaning does not exist. At the interval level, the zero is simply a placeholder to indicate where we started counting or where we began. Um, this one would be like, if you're measuring years, like if I say my daughter was born in 2007 or that I was born in 1998, this is um, 2022. Well, how do I know? How do I know that? Well, I know that because at some point humanity began marking off the years. And so at some point we had what was considered year zero. That's where we began counting. Um, another one that's good for this one is like IQ scores or temperatures. You know, if I say, well, okay, your IQ score is zero. Well, that doesn't mean you have no brain. That means that maybe you're not a good test taker, you didn't score well, but it doesn't mean you have no brain. And that's just where the scale, we begin counting. Temperature, if we talk about the fact that it's zero degrees outside, that doesn't mean there's no temperature, that there's no heat or no cold. It actually means it's cold outside if it's zero degrees. So again, zero is where we begin counting. 
right? The last level is the ratio level. At the ratio level, you still have numbers. You still have that sense of order, one, two, three, four, five. But now you have that true zero. Okay, now at the ratio level, zero means none, nothing, nada. Okay, it has that true meaning. But at the ratio level, we can actually add, subtract, multiply, and divide. We can talk about how that um, Johnny is twice as old as his father, or that somebody is, you know, twice as old or three times or whatever. So you can begin to compare those in a ratio or fractional format. That's where you get the idea of ratio. Now again, interval and ratio, they're numbers, which means they only apply to quantitative. And that was a pretty quick review, but again, that's information that hopefully you can recall from your previous encounter with Statistics 1401. Okay, in today's world, guys, all types of companies, from the smallest company to the largest company you can think of, even the United States government are inundated with data on a daily basis. And really you are too, we already talked about that. We use the term now, you'll hear it a lot um, in news reports and articles and that kind of thing, you'll hear the phrase big data. Big data just means you got a lot of it. And we use um, some kind of software, some kind of computer program or something to analyze it. We don't do that by hand. Think about the last two years. People have, they have probably been collecting data. Well, I know they have been collecting data about COVID-19. Guys, that's big data because they've got a lot of information. And so we can analyze that quote, big data to reveal patterns, trends and associations. I had the definition there. Big data refers to large, diverse sets of information where you've taken it from a lot of different sources. And again, it's coming at you fast and furious. It's not necessarily that you have a lot of data, but again, it is important what you do with it. Um, you can take data from anywhere and analyze it to find answers, but you want to make sure that you're analyzing it correctly um, and not um, misinterpreting that information. Data scientist is one, a data scientist is one of the fastest growing um, jobs um, in the market today, and they spend 50 to 80 percent of their time organizing and preparing data before it can actually be used. As you can't just go out on the on the street and collect data and 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 be done. You have to organize it and then do the analysis and then go back and and put it in a format that you can share with other people. And so data scientists spend, you know, 50 to 80 percent of their time doing that. And one of the tools that is used in organizing data is to create pictures or graphs. In statistics, that's called data visualization. So data visualization is a picture or a graphical representation of information and data. Okay, and guys, you'll see this a lot, especially on news reports on television, um, probably on the internet, maybe even on your Facebook feed or Instagram feed. Um, they use pictures and graphs to relay a lot of information because it gives people an easy and quick way to see what's going on, to find those trends, to see if there's any outliers or patterns within the data. Universally, it's used in all industries and it's used in all countries. I 
eyes, you, you may or may not know, but our eyes are drawn to color and patterns. So you'll often see graphs presented um, with some color and dimension to them because again, that's going to catch your attention. Data visualization, those graphs and pictures help us to tell a story and that story has a purpose. You know, the purpose may be, well, I want to make sure everybody knows what's going on or to see the trend, um, you know, the inflation going on in the market or uh, the downtrend in a particular stock or the downtrend in sales. So, you know, there's lots and lots of different ways that you can present data, but you it's a, there's a very delicate kind of balancing act that you have to do to make sure that you're presenting the data in a way that someone can make sense of it. So that that kind of that balancing act between form and function. Yeah, you want it to look pretty, okay, but you also want to make sure it gets your point across. Some consider it another form of visual art because it'll grab your interest and keeps your eyes on the message. Why is it important? Again, it allows us to see a lot of information and a lot of data quickly. I mean, we can take, you know, tens of thousands of pieces of data and organize it into a nice picture or graph and it gets the point across very quickly. And I may try to show you that in a minute. Humans, you may not realize this either, but humans can process visual images, pictures, 60,000 times faster than text. So obviously I got, I'm doing a poor job tonight because I've got text all over everything and not enough um, visual images, but we can process those visual images 60 times, 60,000 times faster. It also, because of that, that's going to enhance and maybe even improve the communication between the stakeholders, your boss, and yourself or yourself and the board. Um, and that'll lead hopefully to faster decision making so that you can continue moving forward and helping the company um, improve and ideally make a profit. Again, it does allow us to identify relationships and patterns within the data a little bit quicker. Um, it highlights those emerging trends. It communicates the story or the message to others very quickly because images do speak louder than words. They know the old saying pictures are worth a thousand words. So images speak louder than words and perhaps gives us an idea of an area that may need our attention or may need improvement. So again, it's just a very quick way to get yourself a snapshot of what's going on at a particular time um, with your company, with, you know, what, whatever it is you're, you're researching at that particular time. Okay, so do, uh, again, I felt like I've been a talking head tonight, but I do want to show you something. If we go out and we just Google, you know, graphs in news, okay? Look at all of these different, if I go over here to images, look at all of these different types of graphs. I mean, you have line graphs, we have bar graphs. I mean, we get all sorts of graphs. Um, sometimes they'll even do them. Um, I saw some earlier, uh, let's see, that were like maps where they were using maps um, to do graphs. Okay, from CNBC, which are, is your news report. And so you get, you know, again, bar graphs, you can use, um, they use pictorial graphs sometimes. This one looks more like a picture um, than it does. There's the bar graph. Okay, so there's just lots of different ways to present the data. And when you're looking at those graphs, you wanna, you know, you wanna be able to understand what's going on. It's important when you're looking 
um, let me pull a uh, pull one up real quick. When you're looking at a graph, you want to make sure that you know you have, say, um, a scale. Okay, so like this one looks like it's maybe years. You need a horizontal scale. You need a vertical scale. Um, you want to you want to make sure and give it a title so that somebody can come along behind you and look at it and know what's going on. Okay, so for example, let's see what you guys can tell me. Here's a bar graph that I pulled off the internet earlier today. Okay, what could you tell me based on this graph? That Jerry is a good salesperson. Okay, that Jerry's a good salesperson. Why would you think that? He made almost 13000 Okay, A. Murray says each salesperson makes progressively fewer sales. It does look like that. It looks that way. This particular type graph is called a Pareto chart because it is set up so that the highest it goes from high to low, so it does appear that way. We wouldn't have to present it that way. Um, we could um, do it alphabetically if we wanted to, and it would look a little bit different. Um, somebody else said um, the amount each person makes in three months. Okay, so again, notice it says it's from January 2013 to March 2013, so that is a three month period. Um, Notice it does tell us we've got the name of the salesperson on. <laughs> Mary is severely lacking by contrast to Jerry. That's true. Giving it seemingly a third of his results. Very good. That's a good observation. Um, and again, we can tell that we don't know exactly the amount that Mary sold. We would have to kind of estimate because, um, you know, we're we're a little above or below bars, but but that's a good observation. Um, but it does give us the salesperson's name on the horizontal. It gives us the sales. The sales notice the scale looks like it's in thousands. So this is two point six thousand um, dollars, or thirteen thousand dollars, ten thousand four hundred dollars. So again, you got to make sure, especially when you're looking at graphs, guys, that you know how to read them. But you want to have a title. You want to make sure that you label your axes and you label each bar. We also don't know how many days they worked. That's true. That's true. They just, they're just, we're looking at this three day period. The other thing that struck me about it is they don't tell us what they're selling. You know, are they selling cars? Are they selling carpet? Are they selling furniture? I mean, what are they selling? Because that can make a difference too. So it's important, you guys, you got to pay attention to the graphs when you're looking at them, you know, and, and if you're, if you are creating a graph, you want to make sure you include those things like the title and your title needs to have lots of detail. Again, you want to think about the who, the where, the what, the when, the why. And I'm mentioning all this because when we get to project one, guys, you're going to be asked to take your data set and create a graph and then to describe it to me. OK, so these are things that you want to think about. You want to think about, make sure you give it an, a title that's detailed. You want to make sure you label your axes. OK. Um, and then to make observations, sort of like um, A. Murray made, you know, that Mary's severely lacking, that it's a third less. Okay, you, you want to pay attention to those kind of things. Questions? Okay, guys, it is nine minutes till eight, and we really have covered what we intended to cover tonight. Hopefully, as we go, you guys will get a little bit more vocal, and I won't have to be a talking head. 
Um, so the lesson for module one on data and visualization, that quiz is due by Sunday at 11.30 p.m. Okay. So do you have questions before we go? All right, you guys have a good evening and I will see you next Tuesday.